Okay. Um, Pippi Longstocking quote, and I got her full name. Um, last year um, for the presentation, I did a bunch of illustrations and got obsessive about uh, getting pictures off the web and finding out what license they were under and properly attributing them, doing all that. And I, this year I decided, no way, I'm not going to do that. That was just way too much of a time sink. So I'm going to hand draw everything myself, which I almost did. There's two. And then I wound up getting quotes and obsessing about attributing the quotes. My name is Marcus Roberts, and I am, an, I am an obsessive. OK. Um, she called it plutrification. She meant multiplication. And that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today. But first, I'd like to start with a show of hands. OK, good. <laughs> Wait. A couple of people don't get how this works. OK, show of hands. OK, good. OK, good. Everybody's. OK, we're going to get your blood going and everything. So how many of you self-identify as developers and are willing to admit so publicly? Software developers. OK. Um, so the people who aren't raising their hands are the ones you guys need to watch out for because they've got a legitimate grievance against you. Um, <laughs> we'll be getting into that a little bit more later. How many of you self-identify as human? Okay. Most of the time, yeah, okay. Um, that's something we're also going to be talking about. Um, how many of you believe yourself relatively conversant with math, numbers, things? First of all, how many of you are mathematicians? Okay. How many of you think you know some math? Okay. How many of you think you could name a number if your life depended on it? You're aware of some sort of numbers. Okay. Yeah, pretty good. So, um, oh, actually, um, when you guys code, which hand do you write code with? Both? Both hands? I have developed a great system. I write code with my right hand. I write bugs with my left. <laughs> and then if it's important, I just sit on one hand. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've got, the system isn't quite perfect. I've got some bugs to work out. But in theory, it should, it should be a, a good system here. So um, a little bit of a background um, for everyone here. Um, this is, in some extent, a continuation of last year's talk. But if you didn't see last year's talk, have no fear. The people who saw last year's talk are going to be under no advantage in understanding this talk. There's no <laughs> benefit to be gained from it. Um, the two points that do come up, I've bagged the slide from actually last year's talk and then two years before that. I kind of crammed them into one slide so that the relative bits of context gets brought forward. Um, and if you guys, any who were here last time, I got through about two thirds of the material and then had to cut off abruptly and just raced for an exit and came up with a conclusion and said I would present the rest of it in some subsequent talk. That's what this started out to be. It had a life of its own. It's kind of gone off in some other direction. Um, and it also has the risk of running over. There's a very good chance that we will run over this time. And it's timing a talk like this is really hard. Um, it's a really, um, if uh, I've got a regime that I do. I drink coffee before the talk so that I'll be talking fast enough that I hopefully can get through all the material in the time allotted. And right before, I do a bio break. Because I found when I don't do the bio break after drinking all the coffee and start the talk, then I talk way too fast. And I rush through all the material, and we're done in no time. And yeah, so hopefully we should be about right. Now, in case we're not, and I run over, I've decided to do something a little bit different this year and give you guys the big picture outline of what we're going to be covering today so that if we have to skip some parts, um, you'll at least have some orientation. And this may help um, in what I said may. OK, I didn't say will. There was no contract. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So um, basically, we're going to be talking about integers and operations on integers. And then um, for some reason about animals, and I'm not, it, it made sense at the time. 
and then about how we manage to accomplish things, and then kind of about why our software sucks, and I'm also going to be poking uh, some fun uh, back at um, some of the recent accomplishments in software, um, and quizzes and whatnot as needed. So uh, there's the basic. Uh, by the way, this is going to be a take-home assignment, the profit, because um, we're probably not going to get to that. Okay. So um, for those of you who haven't been uh, to one of these before, I do these as a public service because we're civilized now, mostly. But that's a relatively recent thing that's happened to us. And many of us still have urges and things that don't quite fit in a civilized environment. And here we're at a conference where we're having to sit quietly and listen to presentations. And we're having thoughts in our heads that we want to announce, we want to share, we want to participate. We're sitting around the tribal campfire, we want to be part of the tribe, but the recent trend is, no, you guys all sit there, the person sits up here, they talk, you listen, whatever. This is your reprieve from that. Okay, I don't want to be doing all of the talking. In fact, if I do less than half of the talking, I'm going to count this a huge success. And. I want to use a reward system to make sure that I'm getting the sort of comments that I want. So if you make an unhelpful, disruptive, gratuitously humorous, or otherwise distracting remark, I will punish you by throwing you some candy containing peanuts, in case you have a nut allergy, <laughs> chocolate, Artificially fruit flavored for those of you who prefer, I'll give you your choice. All of them loaded with sugar that will rot your teeth. However, if you make a useful comment, a helpful contribution, I have some 100% pure chocolate, no sugar, no harmful. This is proven to have good health benefits. I'll give you the good stuff <laughs> if you put trip. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking, should I say it or not? Um, and, um, and heckling, trolling, that sort of thing, very, very welcome. Does anybody want to try? This is like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Terrible, yeah, yeah. No cans of cream corn? No, um, the, I did bring the slingshot from the one where I had the olives, though. Um, <laughs> but the organizers have asked that uh, no pickled things and no fresh fruit. Because the fresh fruit seem like a real healthful alternative too. Um, so first thing we're going to talk about today, and this is where we get into the real audience participation, is our friends, the integers. Do you guys think you kind of have a pretty good feel for the integers? You think so? OK. OK. So. Um, what sort of things could you guys tell, um, if I gave you two integers, could you tell which one was larger in magnitude? Depends, are you writing it or are you saying it? Ah, uh, yeah, well. Are you describing them or actually telling you That's a very, very perceptive, and the answer is some animals have fur. <laughs> okay, but we'll get to that in a moment. How about, um, could you guys tell an even number from an odd number? OK, show of hands. Come on, should we, we practice this. Even a Vermont? OK. Could you spot a power of 10, you think? OK. How about a prime? What? You guys just spot a prime? In what, an integer. One of the integers. Oh, you thought I said five? You could spot a five. OK. Reliably? What? OK. At 1,000 yards. OK. Um, what? A multiple of a prime. <laughs> yeah, could you spot a multiple of a prime? Yeah. Um, okay. Actually, how many of you could spot a multiple of a prime? <laughs> okay. You guys do know something about the integers. That's actually a, that's actually a property of the integer. And actually, that was disruptive. There. Ooh. <laughs> that you get the reward for not shutting him up. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, when you guys do. Um, Call out if you have preference. I'm going to be throwing the dark chocolates or the peanut butter cups, but if you want one of these, just, just let me know. OK. Um, how about a perfect square? 
new spot. Usually. What? Usually. Usually? Okay. Was full of yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to test you guys with some numbers. Oh, actually, I think we're we on the next slide. Okay. We're going to try an experiment. Even or odd, answer as quickly as you can. Uh, Even or odd? guys are synchronized. <laughs> synchronized mumbling. This is great. So what it is is one of you actually is answering the question and has a drawl and the rest of you are really good at that trick where you can hear so many you know, so, um, so how about the next time the one of you who's actually making the decision trolls the others and no. That's a little base too for those of you who have trouble. Okay. You guys are good. <laughs> My cat didn't get nearly this many. <laughs> who who said somebody yeah, who said that fast? You did. Which you want? Dark chocolate. Yeah, so how do you know that that's odd so fast? Because it's base 3. It's a, it's a multiple of 3. It's a multiple? Well, 6 is a multiple of 3. Wait, I mean, it's a power of 3, right. So odds times odds are almost always odd. What? <laughs> They're always odd, OK. Okay, who said that first? Yeah. What do you want? Okay. I'm doing the underhanded action here. Okay. Four thousand on four, base seventy-one. Okay, who said even first? Okay, what do you want? Okay, how do you know that that's even? The what? The no. no. It's, what? It's, what? It's four times something plus four times one. And so it'll also, so it's even. Right. It's, even. It's, it's all of these things are even. Yeah. And so therefore, regardless of the base. Right. OK. This is base 17. <laughs> what? Even. Odd? Odd? Yeah. How do you, okay, who's, talk, talk us through it. Whoever said it, you said it first, I think? Or who's, what? Okay. Okay, who can talk me through a conclusion, convince us that this is true? No, it's base 17. Oh, but the, right, the extension, the normal extension, right. Oh, here you go. <laughs> You're right. That, that, that was an ambiguity. That's a good point. Um, and see what it got you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm using the normal A is 10, B is 11, base 10, etc. Um, would you really like something edible? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. Um, Okay, so we're, we're, I think we're still, we don't have actually somebody who's published and not retracted their paper on why this is so, even. Uh, it must have an, odd, an even number of odds as its digits. Okay. And we could say that some of those, uh, like, the these, these, these cancel each other out. If these cancel each other out, and uh, the A's are evens, and maybe the G is an odd, and the E is an odd. Wait, E is what? E 
is 14. And G is what? Oh, 16. 16. Okay, so then, okay, so only the B's are odd and they cancel each other out. Okay. By the same logic. And that was a collaborative effort? Yes. Okay, which, what do you want to split? <laughs> Chocolate? Okay, why don't you bite off half and give it to the other? Okay. Okay, you guys did really well at that. I'm disappointed. Okay. Okay, let's try something a little different. And I'm sorry, I promised I wouldn't go over there, and I'm, 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 I'm a bad monkey. Okay. So... Who can give me the first power of 10 that's greater than um, that number? Yeah. You don't have to raise your hand. Don't be shy here. That's six zeros, base three and six zeros. Is that 10 base three or 10 base 10? This is 10. Oh, unsubscripted. That's a, that's a good point. OK. Um, unsubscripted. Numbers are base 10. If I don't subscript, they're base 10. And the reason for that, does anybody know the reason for that convention? No. For the reason for, for unsubscripted ones being base 10, if you don't do that, what do you put, there? What do you put forward? Right, you, 10? <laughs> it's like, how do you express the bases? Unless you have a subscript that says what base the subscript is in. And it turns out there's only a finite amount of ink in the world, and it's, it's, you don't, you'd run out, and you'd still be ambiguous. If you wrote it smaller, you might not necessarily get out. You could have a There you go. <laughs> you guys are being really helpful this morning. Okay. What? 10,000. Yes, How do you get that? Because I counted the number of digits, and I multiplied three that number of times. You did? <laughs> okay, what do you want? That was disruptive. Uh, the answer to your question is no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I didn't. I want the, the, the smallest in the normal order of integers. What's the, actually, um, the first power of 10 that is greater than that. But yeah, I guess yes, that is ambiguous. There is no one in this room that can tell you what the first. Yeah, there is. But I'm presenting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and you all can if you think about it. What? Yeah, it's a thousand. Do you want to walk through the explanation? Uh, the one is in the like seventh digit, so it's three to the sixth power, which is they calculated all the way out twenty-seven hundred twenty-seven is somewhere less than a thousand. There's an easier way. Okay, what you what you do? Okay, take a pair of them, make a nine. This is 9 times 9 times 9, OK? Oh. Right? And so that's a little less than 10. So it's going to be about 720 something or whatever, 729. Boy, I did it. So uh, you can do it without multiplying by saying by making the tenths. But um, let's see, and you're having fruit, aren't you? OK. OK. This one should also be easy. First integer greater than 1,000 that's a multiple of 64. Okay. Um, you guys are just going to have to smash this into. I'm not going to award you guys. I'll talk at once. <laughs> uh, I don't award for guys. Okay. First English word, because we noticed that Babbage, right, could be a number in a base that's high enough to support it. So base 36, we can have all the letters. What is the first English word in base 36 that is a multiple of 64? <laughs> no, A is 10. No, a, 10 is not a multiple of 64. I thought you guys knew the integers. Come on. Aardvark. Yes. Thank you. I'm glad somebody read the description of this talk online and remembered to answer aardvark. <laughs> if you hadn't done that, the excerpt wouldn't have actually been part of the talk and the very fabric of reality could have been threatened. <laughs> Thank you, that was very helpful. <laughs> I always wondered, he asked me, like, 
you know, an excerpt from the talk, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say. Sometimes I'm, you know, I'm like following along thinking, what did I just say? So, yeah, okay, thank you. So, you guys know some stuff about the integers, kind of, but it feels a little rough around the edges. Let's go to programming, because a lot of you said you knew programming. Um, I got two questions about this code. First question, what does it compute? What does it do? The product of A and B. What, uh, what do you want? Chocolate, peanut butter cup? Peanut butter cup. Okay. Okay, second question, what's its big O? What's its performance? Or the, on the order of A times B? So on the order of C, effectively. Does everyone agree with that? Everybody see the garden path I'm leading you down? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's a big what? The width. Okay. He's starting there. He's noticing something about the gingerbread house here. He's like, ah. Oh. It's a little odd. Why is there smoke coming out of the chimney of this gingerbread house that he's leading us towards? Yeah, a bigger question here, and I'm, I'm using Nuth's, I, this is a, a thing that I think Nuth and me and maybe three other people are pedantic about. Um, so if we're going to take the successor of a number, okay, would you add one to it? And I'm using member instead of saying it equals the order of, say it's a member of the set of things of the order. Your assumption is that that is one. Incrementing is on the order of one. It's not. What is it? Okay. It depends on your implementation. Ooh. Yeah, what do you want? Fruity stuff. Fruity stuff. Okay. One of each here. <laughs> Man, 20 minutes in and I'm depleting my supply. I'm going to have to starve you guys. I have to maybe, maybe ask you harder stuff. Mm. Okay, so it's um, on the order of log n. What else could it be? Anything. Anything, yeah, I think. Okay, can you give me an example of some other anything? What? Okay, so a unary representation, it could be on the order of n. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Consider yourself bribed. Okay. Um, actually, though, wait a second. Is it log base 1? Because the log of base 1, it's log base, that's um, more like ln of 1 plus epsilon of n. The, the limit of this is proportionate, uh, and you're going to have to, uh, I think it's epsilon times that. What? Right. Well, because the thing is, what power do you raise 1 to to get 7? It's big, right? I mean, it's like, I, um, so, but 1 plus epsilon, it would be big if epsilon is small, but you do something like this, and yeah, there's something like that you can do that the limit, I should do this here, the limit as epsilon approaches zero um, of something like this, and I'm going to say maybe, that maybe equals that. Um, the other possibility, it could be one. So um, the unary representation, uh, also church numerals, okay? Um, how many of you are familiar with church numerals? Okay, what? Are those the ones that you go to Atlantis? No, those are the ones that you go and worship and, you know, like the Pythagoreans, <laughs> they go to church and, yeah. No, so, okay, so um, let's suppose that and there's a lot of ways to do this. This pin is starting to go. No, these are my pins. Um, but they've been through a lot. I do a, uh, I do a math club for grade school kids. 
and these are the, the math club pins I just bagged. Suppose you have zero, and you, we have our successor function given to us. Okay, so we have zero, successor of zero, successor of successor of zero, like that. That gives us at least the, um, the cardinal numbers. How many of you guys know the difference between cardinals and ordinals? Okay, um, so no bird watchers here, I guess. Uh, so um, the cardinals are the counting numbers. They start at zero. The ordinals are the ordering numbers. They start at one. They're also known as the positive numbers and the non-negative numbers. Yeah, <laughs> when they've elected a new zero, yes. Um, okay, um, so if what we're doing, our representation here, is that we have the number as like a Kant cell, we're doing something lispy, and so if we want to make a successor to it, we've got our zero, and one, we just have this thing here that points at zero, and two, we have this thing that points at one, right? So if somebody gives us some number here that points off somewhere or maybe a zero, all we have to do is allocate a new one of those. Because memory allocation, of course, is constant time, right? There's no, <laughs> no overhead there. Um, assuming that we're in an environment, like a stack environment, where we're not paying garbage collection amortized overhead. Um, we could digress there, but that way lies, oh, madness. You know, if you do anybody want to go, I guess, suppose we could. Write only memory. Yeah. Well, if, yeah. if we're going to be worrying about overflowing a fixed with integer type, don't we also worry about running out of stack? Uh, no, because we're on a Turing machine. No, uh, we're doing yeah, it's a 16-bit Turing machine. Um, so, um, but yeah, so they, in some plausible world, in the same sense that we could look at that as a reasonable answer, maybe not absolutely correct. And actually, the O1 that we started, we started with O1, with a different implementation, which is the hardware does it, therefore it's O1. Um, <laughs> There's an instruction. I remember the days when instructions had different costs, you know, and you had to care. And nowadays you're talking about, oh no, it's, it's the cost to fetch the darn instruction, and that's really all you care about. Um, so any other um, possibilities? Yeah? Uh, order of zero, if, yeah. if uh, the optimizer Optimize. oh. That's a good one. Okay. Um, you were doing chocolate, right? Oh, I'll switch peanut butter. Peanut butter, okay. Okay. Um, let's see if I've got any others. Um, so we're acting as if it's constant. Okay. Um, some representations, all of these have representations that go with them. What would you say the cost of increment in Roman numerals looks like? <laughs> Yeah. I think it's still log. What? It's still log. It's still log. Yeah. Although he made a good point after, because they top out, and then at some point it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so it's, for the low end, it's log, but it's asymptotically like the church numbers, I think. But also, you could just use uh, you know, binary as your representation and just do, a, and just show the Roman numerals. Oh, okay, but yeah, I think if it was your internal, but yeah, if your internal representation is binary and you're on like a one-bit architecture, then we're in the log n. If you're on a sufficiently wide architecture, you're on the one. Um, and actually, this log n is, is that correct? Because really, the reason we're saying that is carry propagation, right? But half the time, you're not going to have to carry so that looks like it's constant time too, maybe. Yeah. What? Worst case, right? But the amortized case is going to be one, because half the time you don't need to do anything, and and so it's going. To, okay. Um, how about? Oh, uh, what should I do? I do. I do? Um, somewhat worse. I have bit strings, and a bit string 
representation of an integer is the number of one bits in that bit string. So there's ambiguous representations. I think increment is going to be proportional to the probability that I can find a zero to set to one on a scan of it, which is going to depend on whether I've, no, Jacob's just, make it longer. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, uh, what do you want? Sure, yeah, Okay. Um, okay, so how about text? Um, first thing, 17 is written like that. That's going to look mostly like our other um, things, except we're probably going to have to worry about making the string longer. And we get garbage collection stuff. How about... That would be fun to increment. I'm not even going to try and guess this. Um, a harder one, um, a JPEG of a handwritten numeral. <laughs> what? Yeah, it is. So it, it, it depends on how many people are trying to get to the site. Um, <laughs> the, 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 I mean, exactly. Um, another interesting way to represent numbers. So catches are constant Are they? Does it depend on what? Are they constant time or is it? Because I think it's a function of how good your content is. Right? So if everybody's seen the cat pictures that you're doing and nobody's trying to get to them anymore because it's last week's virus, then yeah. Um, okay. So what if we had a representation that is a vector that that's how we represent, actually, I'm going to switch pins here, uh, clear myself some space. We could represent the number. Um, that's one. That's two. Okay, somebody shout out when you see what I'm doing here. That's three. That's four. That's five. That's six. Okay, what do you want? Uh, what? Peanut butter. Peanut butter cup. What did you say? I said it looks like binary. Oh, I, no. You said binary? I said binary. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I thought you said the right way. I said it's before you. What? No. Okay. So this is five. On that's six. Yep. That's seven. And uh, what do you want? Chocolate or peanut butter? Or? What fruit? That's it. See, that's what a trick. If you're if you're really annoying me, I start throwing your candy out the door. <laughs> if you really annoy me, I'm gonna see if I can get one of the windows open. Go fetch. <laughs> okay, prime factorization. The interesting thing about this, if this were how we represented the integers, how many of you guys could spot a prime just visually looking at it? Yeah. Okay. How many could spot a perfect square just looking at it? All, all the things would be even. Okay. Anybody want to guess the complexity of increment with this representation? <laughs> so if you were having to spot perfect squares or um, uh, things that are, um, uh, there's various other properties, you know, primes and things like that, things with only two factors, this would be a great representation for doing those things efficiently and really lousy if you ever had to add. Um, how would you implement multiply in that? Yeah, just, just add the corresponding. Peanut butter cup okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you explain the representation of the Oh, I'm sorry. So one has no factors. Two has a, I'll write the things down here. Um, two, three, three, five, and seven, and so on. So this is a two, because it's two to the first power. This is a three, three to the first power. This is four, because it's two times two. This is five, it's got one five. This is six, it's a two times a three. This is seven, 
um, it is um, a 7. So 9 would look like, um, yeah, so that's 9. And then 8, yeah, 8 would be um, 3, a 3 in there. Right, right, so, and, and so on. So just adding the columns gives you multiplication. Okay, um, I would not want to try and guess what the complexity of, um, addition, or multi, of uh, addition increment would be in that. So that's, that's going to be um, hard, um, so, okay. What? Again, caching, and so it's. But, so one of the things, actually, complexity in time and complexity in memory, you can often trade off against each other um, in the small range. But eventually, it always winds up being about time. If nothing else, it's the time it takes for your new memory chip to get shipped and installed. Um, okay. So, show of hands, how many of you know how to multiply? Okay. Can multiply numbers in your heads. Let's let's check again. Two times three. Okay, you guys know how to multiply, some of you at least. Now, the interesting thing, how do you multiply? There's a couple of ways, at least, that you can multiply. There's the way we were all taught in school, I'm going to call this the official algorithm. There's the one you guys just used. How many of you mentally imagined or actually wrote out in your head this when I asked you two times three? No. You remembered it. You've got that filed away someplace, and that was just to recall that. Um, there's a way they're teaching in school these days. Um, you write, like for a two-digit number, right there and there. And then you just write, fill in those products. And it's really another way of laying that out. Has anyone ever seen this diagonal method you've, you've seen? Yeah, OK. OK. There's an older way that a lot of people do without even thinking about it which is to imagine it in a geometric way and break it into chunks that may not align with the base system. They might, but it might be I happen to know 12 times what, so I'm multiplying 15 times 7, and I know that 15 is 12 plus 3, and I know that 3 times 7 is 21, and so, yeah. Is it basically using the distributive property? Yeah. So all of these are going to have different big O's. And also, depending on a representation, yeah? I'm wondering if you've ever seen the technique where you draw crosses through each other in different directions with some like the vertical of the crosses. You know what's funny is I saw that, and I tried to look it up to include it. And that sort of description defies Google's ability to serve as my memory. I'm like, you know, Google that thing with the line and the stuff and whatever. And I'm, no, I did not want to see that image. No, okay, no, Google, down, down, you know. Um, wow, I didn't even know they could do that, you know. And, um, but I did not actually find, I don't know how to do that. Do you know how to do it? Yeah. Can, actually, here, um, whiteboard, come up here. Our guest speaker is going to show us. Yeah. I told you. I warned you. So I might not remember it properly. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, actually, wait a second. Wait, 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 wait here. We could okay. just stand close to each other, or okay, I don't okay. know what your personal space. I don't. I don't care that much. Um, so say we have like twelve times twenty-three, right? Okay. So we can do like one, and then two for the twelve, and then two, and three, and you have. These, and then these, and then oh. these. So you have three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, four, four. That's a terrible four. Okay. How many of you know how to write the integers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so what you're doing is you're just adding up like the verticals of the amount of crosses they have. So like one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one, two, three, four, right? Okay. And that should be right. I don't actually know. So it's, yeah. it's, it's not? Very much not. Okay. It's roughly double what it should be. Okay. 
Well, there's this is something like the technique. Okay, but I don't go to a Japanese elementary school. They do teach this in Japanese elementary school. Wait though. a second. So, um, so you're saying 12 um, times 23, okay? Yeah, it's roughly double. But it can't be exactly double because you've got an odd number. Yeah. What? Supposed uh, to be. I might have. It's apparently 483. <laughs> I might have done it upside down. That's the other thing. Oh, you know what? Yeah, because. Oh, yeah, okay, wait a second. Let's do a do-over. We'll just edit this and make it look like you got it right from the first time. We can do that, right? We can just edit it. <laughs> so don't worry about making a fool of yourself. We'll just edit it out. Okay. Possibly. Did we have you sign a disclaimer before we did this about ridiculing you in public? Oh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> that, that counts, right? We got it. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah, you're right. If you rotate it 90 degrees, let me try and do that in my head right now. You could do it on the whiteboard. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, da -da -da. that looks promising. This digit's at least right. One, that two, digit three, looks good. Four, five, six, seven. 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 Yay! Okay. okay. So there's another method. Yeah. Now. Is that right? You, oh. So you just have to like, get the rotation right. And if you, if not, you're in some alternate math. The Japanese multiplication method. Japanese, yeah. Actually, somebody had suggested after, someone had suggested after I was doing this that what I should do is think of every like ethnic group or culture or whatever and look up Arabic multiplication method. Look up, you know, like what's the Hungarian multiplication method and. Um, and I started saying, okay, well then I should just write a script to do that, right? And start, you know. Um, and that was a digression. I like that we've learned that, that multiplication is 483 in base 90 degrees. In base 90 degrees, yeah, there. Yeah. Well, not multiplication. 12 times 23 is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who, who said that? Who said Okay. Do you want chocolate or. Okay. Oops. Okay. So we've got various representations. We've got various algorithms. These algorithms are kind of biased towards uh, decimal representation. I think that's maybe how we probably store numbers, but it's not clear. So, does um, actually is there, oh, there's actually um, I had some other algorithms on my list here. Hold on a second. Let me see what. Um, not yet. I'm not saying that yet. What? Okay, so um, another one that we could do is, and you actually see this when you're teaching kids, repeated addition. And when the kids do the repeated addition and they do addition by counting, you don't want to ask them a multi digit multiplication problem before lunch. <laughs> but you know, um, but yeah, some do repeated addition. Um, there's also a finger trick that I couldn't find, which um, do not, do not Google for finger trick. Okay, uh, okay, they're all variously disturbing. What? I never have safe search, honey. You kidding? You don't get the interesting stuff that way. Um, so, another algorithm. Oh yeah. Yeah. That works if you multiply only multiply ever by nine, which I suppose you could arrange your life that way. Um, uh, one of my favorite algorithms for multiplication I'm seeing people do more and more is Google for it. <laughs> now. What I'd like to do is think for a minute about not only the big O of Google for it, but think about the computational cost of Googling for it from a system with a, yeah, I mean, it's not, ah, I mean, do you realize how many multiplications it takes just to render the answer in a font on the screen? Yeah, it What's makes, to route the eye, it's like, ah! And, but, and usually, uh, I use Google a lot for um, units, uh, units like pounds and kilograms and whatever. Yeah. 
and usually the thing that I'm also doing, uh, the Google like gave me the answer, but the first search result is a Yahoo answer with that question. <laughs> 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 That's weird. Um, and sometimes I even click and try to answer to that person like. <laughs> Are they mostly not answered? So I wonder if somebody did a bot and just did on the questions. Let's ask all possible permutations. Do you want uh, something? No, thanks. No. You're trying to keep your independence. You don't want to be beholden to it. Yeah, Pietro wants his independence. What? Throw me anything. <laughs> what do I got here? Oh, um, no. I'll take a laptop. Yeah. <laughs> oh. There is, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, there's also like Wolfram Alpha. Yeah. Uh, and there you can ask more ridiculous questions like, how many calories in a cubic parsec of butter? <laughs> there's also a language, um, uh, is Frisk? I think Frisk? Frisk? Frisk, I think it is. Um, there's a language that does that. Um, that's like Wolfram Alpha, but you can, Wolfram Alpha, but you can program in it. Um, and it does units and it does conversions and everything. It's what? No, no. There's it's a so there's a I'm sorry, open source bridge, um, which last I heard Mathematica wasn't. Um, but yeah, but there's an actual like open source language. I, I has, unit, unit has units and it has a whole bunch of library stuff that they stole from one of the proprietary projects because that's how we roll. No, I did not say that. Any lawyers watching this, this is a humorous thing. Do not sue anyone based on anything that I say except for maybe me, and I probably deserve it. Okay. I heard that's going to be an active support five. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, another interesting algorithm, and this is a member of a class of algorithms along with Google. Google it. Um, generate and test. And you would be surprised if you watch people actually do. People generate and test. They guess the answer and say, no, no, it's got to be a multiple three. That can't be it. Or, no, that's odd. That's... And we almost sort of started doing that here, right? So that's a respectable algorithm. Um, and they're in a class of what I call WA's wonder algorithms. Because they can apply with very little modification to all sorts of different problems, not just multiplication, like how deep should I plant a tomato plant? You can use the same algorithm to get that answer. Google for it, you know. Um, Is that technically an algorithm, though? That's slide um, seven. I think that's slide seventeen or something like that. I will be addressing that question. Um, <laughs> what? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is it Google part in the file cabinet? It's like yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you're doing chocolate, or okay. Okay. So um, the the thing about wonder algorithms is that they're wonderful. That they could be used for anything. And yeah, as Sam points out, some people might quibble about my term um, uh, use of the word algorithm, and I've got a slide for them later. But first, an experiment. We've looked at these various things. Does, oh, does anyone have a, this is going to require a timekeeper. So if somebody's got like a stopwatch function, okay? And actually, if I could get somebody to be a recorder and come up here and tabulate um, the, and write on the things. So I need somebody to do times and somebody to come up here and whiteboard for me. And what I'm going to do is we're going to do some multiplication problems in our heads with no paper or anything else. You know, we're going to just do it. And we're going to see how long it takes the first person to get the answer. And see if we can see any pattern that might tell us what sort of algorithm that we're actually using in our heads when we multiply these things. So we're going to do a, a little brain hacking. OK. The first correct answer, and it, you did you see my slide deck? I I smell a spy, a rat. I've been hacked. Okay. Always ask that guy. That's O one if he's there. Actually, it's O distance to that guy. Or well, actually, no. But there's a DOS attack. I don't know. Um, so, okay. So, um, let's try and start. Uh, I'm gonna pick some here, semi at random. Okay. So I'm going to tell you, I'll show you these, but don't start writing until I show them. Okay, multiple, oh, okay, go.
Okay, how long was that? One and a half seconds. One and a half seconds. Okay. Fifty-eight times twenty-one. Is that right? Actually, what I probably need is somebody with a calculator who, after the answer, <laughs> somebody to figure out what the right answer is. That would be really good. See, this is how science is done. You do the first couple rounds. You go, okay, throw out that data we we actually should have done. Yeah, it is twelve eighteen. Twelve eighteen and the time. Um, so what we want is somebody whoever's got the calculator. Uh, who's going to be our calculator person? Okay, so, um, and actually we want somebody who doesn't think they're likely to be, are you likely to be, okay, fast, okay. Okay. If it was the first answer, that was around four seconds. Okay, and yet what we do is, you're going to time from when I say the answer to when he says correct. If he doesn't say correct, you guys need to keep going. No, I say the question, and then, yeah, we're, we're working this out. Okay, here we go. Forty-one times twenty-three. Nine forty-three. Correct. Five point three. Twenty times forty. That was essentially zero. Uh, <laughs> I am not going to give negative time. <laughs> Twenty times forty is eight hundred. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> if you get it right, I'm going to be really, really, really disturbed. And I love that. Okay. 96 times 26. 24.96. How long was that? Okay, 27 times 28. Why are we doing this? Yes. The, the, that's the slide right before the algorithm slide. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming, guys. Okay. And yeah, we're, we're actually doing okay on time. Okay. So a couple more. Go. 30, 50 times 64. And where did that other one go? That's about one and a half. Yeah, actually, by the way, on some of these, um, doing it in your head is actually faster when I've done this. And there's, um, and that actually surprised some people. I had people that just would not believe that calculators were slower. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, one more. 85 times 1 million and 1. Okay. So how long was that? The answer started around four seconds and ended around five seconds. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's look at these numbers briefly here. And what we're thinking about is all the possible representations, all the possible algorithms that we could be using internally. Okay? And I posit, given, say, these two data points, that it is not proportionate to either of the arguments. It's not on the O of 
one million and one or whatever. It's not the result. It's not either the argument. Um, based on some of them, it's not quite the complexity. Like 2040 um, and these took longer. The 64 one was fast. Yeah, it is for some. So, yeah. Oh, by the way, um, I'm noticing a disturbing tendency to raise hands. What have I told you people about shouting out and interrupting me? Okay. Yeah, I did. Okay. So, sh hey, <laughs> ah, regress. No. Okay. So, um, so, so talk. One. Yeah. The 64 one was easy because of the 50. Like that's just. It's half. Okay. It's one half of a hundred. Yeah times a power of two, which you happen to have handy. Right, that's simple. Like, I explained that to the, yeah. You should teach math to kids. Multiples oh. of two and five. Multiples of two and five, okay. So one million and one is what, a multiple of two or five? Okay, well, it's, okay, it's, well, it's a multiple of 10 plus one. Multiple of, yeah, okay, so wait a second. 21 is a multiple of 10 plus one, um, and we could have other ones. I think that, but it's on the same one. Well, that's how I did yeah. 96 times 26. If I did 2600 minus 104, I think you're generally faster the matrix you have for representing the numbers. And the yeah, and, 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 and there's no overhead for inner converting. So the fastest ones are all the ones that you're familiar with. 20. Okay, by the way, what do you what do you have? What's your poison of choice? Um, so far, Baker's chocolate. Um, <laughs> what, what, what would you like? <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. But you know, I do this three different, I do this three totally separate ways. A million and one times anything, that's pattern matching. I don't even care what the numbers are. Okay. That could be a, a zero, 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 a for a million and one times a. So there's pattern matching on stupid things. 2.6 is straight memory recall from kindergarten. You know, right. That's 12. Okay. And then I do the partitioning for like 25 times 12. That's just partitioning. 250 plus 50. You know, that's just. How do you decide which of these to use and why is there no overhead for that? Two digits times two digits, that's, that's going to be partitioning all the time. My brain doesn't even bother with anything else. They, they so, sort of so wait, 10 times 10, you partition how? 10 times 10 is memory from kindergarten. Okay. Oh, you said two digits are going to be partitioned. Okay. So, um, one thing I think we've learned here, and actually, what do you, do you want some, some sort of something to rot your teeth for that? Good. You sure? You deserve to have your teeth. Okay, so you want something, you want something to put on weight with then? No? You would just pat your belly. What? Um, I got more peanut butter cups than anything. Seven times twenty-eight. Though. Now, by the way, watch what he did there. Do you guys see what he did? That's amazing. Oh yeah. He caught both. He caught both of them. Caught and both I think you all, did. I caught one, and the other one bounced off. Okay, the you almost caught both of them. Okay. Before we move on, Marcus. Uh huh. Um, one thing that I noticed is that uh, these things were fast, and we didn't have to use a lot of working memory to keep track of intermediate results. Okay. Okay, and actually, yeah, so do you guys get the, um, <laughs> there you go, oh, ooh, sorry, okay. So what's the deal with sevens? What is the deal with sevens? That's actually, that's a slide later on. Okay, so, um, eventually, but I've also, see, this is, I don't like to toot my own horn, but I did tell you that we're not going to get to all the slides, probably. And <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not fiendishly clever, but I've, I've got some tricks. OK, so and the interesting thing about animals is that some animals have funny names. The pink fairy armadillo, the axolotl, which I, I, I actually used to use that in limericks a lot. It, it's a handy. The blobfish, which do Google for that. That is an amazing thing. I was, um, uh, so to do these illustrations, I was, Looking up, um, I looked through a bunch of Dr. Seuss books to get style ideas on how to draw things. And then I started looking at some of these things, and the blobfish is like, oh, that's, he stole that. Uh, <laughs> you know, and actually, some of these, the, um, um, the um, Osvogel, whatever, uh, Kakapo, um, and some animals don't. Some animals have fur, and some animals don't. Okay? Um, it's a subjective thing, I suppose. Okay, so um, now here's a quiz. This is a this is a spot quiz. It's going to be in two parts. Okay, 
I'm only going to reward for getting both parts right. Quick as you can, somebody, which of these do we get milk from? Okay, could you demonstrate? <laughs> get, 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 get us some milk from that. <laughs> yes. Use mention distinction. That, that I will reward. Um, uh, is that helpful? Or, uh, I don't know. <laughs> there's stuff. Okay, I don't want to think about that. So use mention distinction. And there's levels of it. Animals that have funny names and animals that have fur are different sorts of things, but we blur them in our mind. The name might be funny or might not. It's a thing about the name. But the animals, they don't, if you tip them over, don't try this, this can be dangerous, especially with wild animals, but they don't actually have the names written on the bottom. Now, some of the plastic ones, it might mislead you, they do. If you ever buy little animals, for, you know, look on the bottom, it will say cow and horse and things on it, which I never really understood until I realized how much of an English monoculture the United States are, and it is actually useful. And if you ever go live in a foreign country, it's very handy to have the local name written on the bottom of the animal when you're trying to teach the kid the language that you don't know. But <laughs> we don't get milk from this. We don't even get milk from cow. Okay, Milk comes from this animal that we've also assigned a name to. But when we're doing mental math, we're really wild and loose. We are not dealing with the integers. We're dealing with their names. We're doing pattern matching and we're doing stuff on the integers' names. And because they have the same ontological domain, numbers are concepts, names are concepts, we don't wind up with the cow problem. We don't wind up in a situation where we can't show how we got that from that as long as we follow a really complex list of heuristics that keep us out of trouble. Yeah, that's how we get to them. But as an example, um, the, the, the kids, the math club, the kids, um, love doing things to try and figure out where that boundary is and asking riddles like um, uh, 2 plus what equals fish. And it turns out that 2 plus 2 is fish, um, at least in the grade school mind. Um, and there are actually math problems where you can add numbers by just concatenation. And for certain values, you can multiply, you can do things. Um, and there's a whole set of uh, bar riddles that are like you arrange, um, you know, take nine, uh, nine um, toothpicks and make ten without breaking any of them. And the answer is something like, I think that's eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. So make, yeah. And the reason we can't see any pattern here in to figure out what the algorithm is, looking at the numbers, is that we're not doing it with the numbers. Why do we care? This is where I grabbed two slides from previous presentations. Um, and we're, OK, we're doing OK on time. So one of my previous presentations, we talked about people playing Go at human level Go playing using a Monte Carlo cluster of computers. And um, in case you can't read this, a low power CPU, an atom, uses about 10 watts. A modern server, a CPU, about 100 watts. A server, about 400 watts. The Monte Carlo cluster that they use to play Go against a human used 40,000 watts. The human he was playing against, the human brain dissipates about 10 watts. Okay, This is a, actually worse, I, probably, than Googling for a multiplication problem. This is hideously, hideously, hideously inefficient. Another talk that kept inserting its way in here because it's been bugging me, um, our code sucks. 
So I have been to a number of presentations here. I've, I've sometimes called it, I've sometimes kept it myself. Every presentation I have been to so far that had a code sample, the code sample had a visible bug in it. At least one. Everyone. We're programmers. Presenting to programmers, the code we throw up to show each other, short programs have bugs in them. So we're using a huge amount of power and getting mediocre results. Um, this quote. Right, this is, well, this quote here, every program can be made at least one line short and contains at least one bug, therefore every program can be reduced to a single line of code which still doesn't work. Which was said either by Alan Koch, Dijkstra, Bill Gates, Donald Knuth, Samuel Langhorne Clemens, writing as Mark Twain, and Abraham Lincoln, the internet is wonderful. If you want an answer, there's somebody who will give you the answer you're wanting. Um, and um, So that's why we're looking at this. We have the ability to do something pretty amazing, like playing Go, using some sort of wonder algorithm that would be nice to implement. And we'd like to learn how we think, so maybe we could write some better code. Now, I'm talking about these wonder algorithms as if they are algorithms. And some people are going to object to that usage. OK? Um, to them, I say, yes, you're correct, get out of here. Here's some dark chocolate, here's some unsweetened chocolate. The reason is that if you look at a heuristic um, that's like in an AI program, there's an algorithm that's implementing that heuristic. And you can look at the heuristic, the table, the rules of thumb, as data being fed into a program that's following an algorithm. Likewise, if you look at an algorithm running on a real computer, what it's doing is sloshing electrons around that it'll mostly work in a heuristic sort of way in transistors because we found empirically that you know, this guard bands is mostly, you know, this is kind of, that's a processor, it probably works. Um, as long as cosmic rays don't hit it or the temperature isn't, there weren't any manufacturing defects and all sorts of other hand wavy stuff. In the area we're caring about, the distinction between an algorithm and a heuristic is mostly where you're focusing. So we could say that we're using a bunch of heuristics to solve these math problems. The other thing we could say is we've got a wonder algorithm that takes as input a whole bunch of heuristics and applies them to specific problems. Okay. Um, it could provide, do multiplication. It could also do solving the Rubik's Cube or something, which if we have time we'll talk about in a bit. And also there's this mistaken notion that heuristics sloppy, they get it wrong and whatever. But algorithms, once it's an algorithm, we're in good shape because it's always right. Now, there's a quote, a fairly famous quote from Programming Pearls, John Bentley. He says in section 2.1 of his Sorting and Searching, Newth points out that um, while the first binary search was published in 1946, the first published binary search without bugs did not appear until 1962. Amazing. A couple of things about that. I dug out my copy of Newth, looked in that, session, that section. That is not what Newth says. Okay, Newth points out that there are range limitations, that it's only good for certain values. And implicitly there's a bug there. Newth didn't actually call out that this resulted in buggy behavior. And apparently from context hadn't really thought it through as far as Bentley had. So Bentley caught Newth making an error and then misattributed to Newth and published without ever going back to check to see whether it's Newth had found, which is nice, he attributed to Newth. And then he publishes a binary search algorithm, which some of you may recall was a foo flaw in the Java world because that algorithm got implemented. Turns out to have a bug in it. We found out in 2008 that this thing that we waited all these years to get a correct um, algorithm for had a bug. Also interestingly, independently discovered by somebody who copied out, because when you're doing a binary search, you use a sorted structure. Bentley published a quick sort that you could use to sort those things. Same book, I think it may even have been the same chapter. Guess what? There was a bug in it. If all the values in your table were the same, it would not terminate. So if you gave it a list of more than two, but all the same, it would hang forever. There was a bug in this published algorithm. Dijkstra um, also famously said, I don't have the quote up here, um, uh, you know, beware using this code. I've not tried it. I've, I've only proved it correct. I've not actually tried it. 
Um, so the distinction between algorithms and heuristics, I want to just kind of gloss over for our purposes here because it's not, a, that's a whole other morass that we could do a whole presentation on and I'm wanting to go for the payload. So yes, I, I acknowledge as Sam called me out that I'm being vague here, but um, the reason that we're looking at this specifically at multiplication is because when I throw him those things, he apparently solves a couple of simultaneous differential equations and he constructs actually a combination of sets. He's got to do the whole, anyone's, anyone ever done robotics? Show of hands. Okay. Um, yeah, you can tell robotics people, you ask them to raise their hand in the context of robotics and they're like, okay, yeah, which active AI do the servos and get that up there. Okay. Um, it's hard to do arm motion and things and get all those trajectories and non-intersecting and don't go beyond your limits and everything. And the whole air path thing, which starts out with the parabolic, but there's air resistance and possible wind and there's the tumble and everything. Like, bam, they caught him. Okay. I don't think we could figure that out. So what's happening here? Um, these are English sentences. So are these. Um, the third one. Yes, it's an uh, 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 I don't know how to say that word. Admonishing. Work, work, work. It's a repeated imperative. So, yeah, it's a and which you can do. You can repeat. You know, run, run. Well, actually, that's like just like work, work. I could come up with her. You may want me to do, say verbs multiple times here to kill time, but no, we're we're. You could be, you could be telling the work, which is the middle word, to work, and then no. repeating it after other comments. Yeah. Yeah, this is exactly, by the way, what I'm talking about. Okay, okay. So here's the deal. At some point, we were more like cows in our language skills. Okay, and we had maybe alarm noises and stuff. And then at some point, we got to the point where we could associate them, and we had names, and you know, the classic cavemen, you know, ago, you know. Oh, see Sally work, you know, sort of sentences. And then we get this. What apparently happened, okay, this is uh, reconstruction, um, but there's actually at this point pretty good neurological, there's a lot of evidence to make this plausible, is that people started using language in ways that drastically affected the survival rate of the speaker and the hearer to get it right. Okay, um, run, tiger, turned out to convey valuable information and people who had to go, tiger, tiger, is that the thing that you peel the yellow stuff off of to eat? Those people did not leave as many surviving offspring <laughs> as the ones who were quicker on the uptake. And we have in our brains a couple of pieces of hardware. Okay, one of them that has the wonder algorithm that we're interested in, grabs stuff that it's got at hand, and it puts it together and comes up with all these really clever ways of solving things. All the different ways of multiplication. And if over time the same problem is presented, and it's, we can think of it as like a random seed for a, uh, generating a world in like Minecraft or something. You know, it's a, you're born with random scramble and you just kind of connect it together, you learn things. Not all random scrambles are the same hamming distance from an efficient algorithm. So evolution can apply pressure so that people who are more likely to learn language as spoken in their area, it's easier for them because their random setup happens to be better, are the ones who don't stop to think banana, they survive, they leave more offspring. So over time, something that was a general processing problem that is like we're doing multiplication now is getting pushed to the layer of catching chocolates when they're thrown. Okay, 
You can catch chocolates. I have done this experiment on children. If you throw candy at children who have never had a calculus class in their life, okay, <laughs> they can catch it. It's amazing. It's almost like they're hardwired to catch chocolate <laughs> because they are hardwired, you know, to do things. Or if it's not good, they'll dodge out of there. There's a Wii game that the some uh, kids play where you soccer ball hit it with your head, shoe, dodge out of it, panda head, dodge out of it, soccer ball, you know. Um, the fact that we find that entertaining, when you think about it in an abstract, if you're an alien looking at what do you guys do for fun, we stand in front of a television, tilting back and forth, trying to pretend not to have panda heads hit us. <laughs> yeah, okay, that sounds like a lot of fun. You guys are a great, you, we want to party with you species, you know. You know it's that it's exercising some primal hardware. Okay. The younger ones don't catch it. The younger ones don't. There's a developmental phase. Something is built. Hardware is built as they develop, as children develop, that does body motion and that learns language. Language is at an intermediate step because it turns out that if you take a child from English-speaking parents and raise them in France and only expose them to French, they will not speak English. They will speak French. We don't have the ability to use language, we have the ability to learn language. But there's evidence that as languages are extinguished, because we're losing languages, languages are going extinct, the range of variability of human languages is shrinking. Which means that since language is actually a valuable commodity, there's evolutionary pressure for us to be harder and harder for us to learn novel languages, and we're getting narrower and narrower. If this continues, there will be a language that will be almost innate for us. We're moving towards that. Probably not in vocabulary, but in grammatical form. And maybe eventually vocabulary, because there are certain utterances that are culturally, that don't, don't vary across cultures. In, um, <laughs> um, and there, um, in mostly in the mouth forms and things, right? So there's some pressure there. This is not a good target for us to do archaeology on either. And one of the things that a lot of effort has gone into in AI was trying to do things like computer vision, which, man, do we have a lot of hard coding for vision. And the reason is if you had to figure out how to do vision algorithms as a baby in order to avoid getting stepping into the fire, getting eaten by the tiger, Survival rate, very, very, very low. And in fact, before we were even human, the vision problem had essentially been worked out. The moving the muscles, those things, they're not subject to introspection. Multiplication, on the other hand, is a relatively new phenomenon, and we're not very good at it yet. We're still using the wonder algorithm of I'll just patch together a bunch of shit that I find, happen to find at hand and see um, what works. We are right now smack dab in the middle of one of artificial intelligence's killing fields where many, many, many researchers have gone to die, killed their careers, whatever. Introspection is notoriously an awful way to do artificial intelligence research. Okay. Because it turns out we're not very good at understanding what's going on inside our heads. What? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're, what you're doing is you're telling yourself a story. There's actually an interesting psychological theory that has some benefit. If you start trying to introspect beyond a certain level, there's a part of your brain that is normally used for explaining other people's behavior and making predictive <coughs> things that will make stuff up and tell you, because introspecting when there are tigers and other dangerous things around is bad. Stop, stop, don't, don't agonize. Look, see if there's a bus coming. Forget agonizing about you know, whether your presentation, you know, whether you're gonna like your slides or whatever. Look out for the bus. And it tells you something. It tells you it's good, it tells you it's bad, it gives you an answer. And there's some interesting experience they've done with split brain people where, um, I don't know if you may have seen this, what they do is because the people um, uh, are basically capable of cognition and being unaware of it, they can give them written instructions in one side of their visual field that will cause them to take some action. 
And then the verbal, which is controlled by the other side of the brain, they ask them why they're doing it. They will make stuff up and say all sorts of, you know, so you'll say things like, um, um, uh, you know, pat yourself on the head. And the person will go like this. Then you say, why are you patting yourself on the head? And they'll say, oh, yeah, my head was itching and scratching wasn't doing it, but the patting seems soothing. <laughs> or, you know, I'm worried that my hair is sticking up. They'll, it's supposed to be. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, by the way, the wild hair uh, is part of the presentation and the t-shirt, or the, not the t-shirt, the tie-dye dress shirt, um, my, um, my nephew has a company doing them. I'm going to have his cards down below, I promise. But anyway, um, but they'll make stuff up. So we're bad at introspection. And the other thing is, um, we really sugarcoat our self, you know, we're really good at self-deception. And so we will just give wrong answers. And especially things like vision or motion or whatever, asking people. There's even a thing, uh, the tennis player thing, ask, them, if, ask a tennis player how they hold their racket right before a game, their performance will just drop. <laughs> because they're now thinking about it and they're using the general algorithm when it should be the muscle, you know, the lower level yeah, stuff. Yeah. Including personal history. Yep. Okay. I claim that we're safe doing this because of this. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, it may be apocryphal. Uh, I heard it from somebody who I believe had reason to know. I was unable to find it on the internet, so it can't, of course, be true. But, no. Um, the. <laughs> In World War II, there was an airfield in England somewhere that this guy shows up at with a bunch of model airplanes. And he's high ranking and he's got like security clearance and he's like, don't mess with this guy. And he's got a bunch of paint things, like little paint things. And when the bombers come back from the mission, he takes the model of, that corresponds with the airplane, the, that, you know, that airplane, okay, it's a, one of these, get that model out. He goes out and he looks all over the airplane. And whenever he sees a bullet hole, he makes a little dot on the plane in that spot. And then he dabs paint on the airplane to show that he's already recorded that one. And if there's another one in that spot, he makes another one nearby. Does anyone have any clue why the guy was doing this? Trying to see where enemy fighters actually hit the plane as opposed to where they might be aiming. Well, Okay, right, because the armor goes where they're not getting anything else on that. Because the planes that came back, they get shot. Right, the, right, exactly. What they do is they look for the spots on the plane that there are no dots and increase the armor in those places because those are the planes that didn't come back. It turns out that getting shot in the air is roughly, you're flying through flak, stuff's coming, it's random. You're getting hit in random places all over the plane. You, pretty uniform distribution, especially given you know, the, all the random factors, including, actually it turns out, the top, because things will come down, you'll get shot from above, and you know, there's stuff. But sometimes if you get hit in this particular spot, that plane will never get back to get the dot made, that's where it needed more armor. Okay. That was enough of a sampling. Right, and he did. And apparently, now I don't know this, but I presume there were other people at other airfields doing this, but it was a top secret thing that the Allies were doing in World War II. That What do you want? Anything? Um, okay. Yeah, there's an error in the math there, which he caught. So why do I think we're safe on introspection? I have a game that I like to play with my kids. Whenever we find something like an Oreo that's mismanufactured. So my wife uh, works at Intel, um, mostly concerned with tracking down defects and why manufacturing goes awry. And it turns out that the sort of defects you get tell you an amazing amount about the manufacturing process. 
So imagine you got an Oreo that was right, except that the cookie, the lettering side was down into the frosting. Okay, that would tell you something. Suppose you got an Oreo where the circle of chocolate had part of one circle of writing and part of the other circle, so you had this sort of thing with the, the stuff here, and it's offset. Suppose you got an Oreo that was frosting cookie frosting, okay? And the words are embossed on the frosting, okay? That tells you, but it tells you something. All of these things would give you hints about how that Oreo was manufactured. And if you expand beyond what you think might be going on, okay, you get some very strange things that you could see. Okay, so like a defect that you could see, maybe the writing is blurry. It's like the stuff sagged. Um, I don't think we see it, but it's conceivable that that could be something we could see. What if you got something that had the Oreo, the frosting on edge, and then the Oreo? I would not expect that, but if I saw it, that would tell me a great deal that I probably don't want to know about how Oreos are manufacturing. And this is by far from the most disturbing sort of defect. What if one of them had the word Oreo misspelled? It was O, you know, E R O. Because the, the person wasn't paying attention when they put the letters on that one. You know, elves. Um, so, defects can tell you a lot about the process. And by studying defects, you get around. Um, you get around the introspection problem. You're not looking for how handsome you are, you're looking at your screw-ups, and it's a lot harder to hide those. That's demonstrably incorrect. And it's incorrect in a specific way. Okay, so we can actually think, it's so like, um, if I'm, actually I may be incorrect, the first digit here is right, and the last digit is right, but the middle digit is wrong? No, or is the first it's digit? 806. It's 806, okay. So it's off by 20. It's a type of error. In fact, probably what happened here is 2 times 3 is 6, 3 times 6 is 18, and 1 times 6 is 6. We missed the 1 times 20. So this was done by somebody. And you can see how that error came about, probably. There's a probable cause investigation you can do on errors to see what likely caused them. And if an error occurs in a manufacturing step leading to a result, that means that that step is part of how the manufacturing is done. There's another thing that people in the computer industry, especially people working in the cloud, people working in you know scalable stuff, don't like to think about, is that taking time, having any big O other than big O zero, is a type of defect. It's a soft. The user, if for very uh, sleep, is probably one of the only functions the user actually does want to wait. Everything else, the correct thing is give me the answer right now, bam, before I even ask the question. I just want it. Okay, it's a soft failure. You can wait, and it takes time and everything. But it leaks information in the same way that a failure does, and there are exploits that take advantage of that, where you can check, like if checking for a password. You, know, you, can, you can learn things by timing how long stuff takes. Um, these are all but one of these are the same um, um, shape. One of them is different. Yeah, bottom left is a uh, curl. It's a, the opposite of the others. And research have done many, many experiments of this form and timed how long it takes people to spot that because taking time is an error, we should just all know the right answer immediately, and have determined an interesting thing. When we're comparing objects, we mentally rotate them in our head, and the amount of time it takes is proportionate to how far it is on the shortest path to rotate them into alignment. And that tells you a whole lot about what's going on. And then you can start playing other games with them with different sorts of defects. So we can, by um, 
looking at the time we take to do things or the errors we make, we can learn stuff. Um, so we've got 20 minutes left here. Actually, yeah. Um, uh, one didn't need to look at all of them. It was enough to see that, oh, well, the, this one and this one were very close, so those are the same, and then the one below that is different, so I don't even need to look at the other two. Yeah, for, for the doing this test, I think what they mostly did is it was yes, no tests on a pair. Here, with a bunch of them, it's a little bit conflated because, for instance, if you happened to choose the right one and you were willing to trust my assurance that only one of them was wrong, then you could get it more quickly. So this would not actually be a good timing test. Right. Um, it's not just a linear time to rotate. There's also a deviation that is people who rotated the right, right way or the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is not a, a rigorous. This is an example of that sort of experiment. I mean, that in itself, I think, is pretty interesting. On top of that. Yeah. Yeah, and you get bimodal if it's, if it's right. Um, yeah, and there's actually um, some people, there's some people have a preferred direction of rotation, and you can change them by saying, is A the same as B versus is B the same as A, and they'll take different amounts of time to answer them. <laughs> yeah, um, all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, cognitive psychology is almost deserves an... Uh, it should be called like cognitive hacking or something. There is a field that has moved away from the pseudoscience of psychology and is actually doing real science. And um, we're not going to do that here. Um, <laughs> but we're sketching it. You're going to get the flavor of it. So what I've intended to do here, um, and I've actually done with other groups. This is the only part I've done before, so it's kind of not as, not as interesting to me. Um, and I really would like to try to get done on time today. Um, I'm going to skip this one a little bit. I'm going to tell you what it is. Um, if we did the same thing, instead of having you call out your answers, what we do is you have paper and you write down. This works great if people are at desks. Write down all the guesses and you get a point if one of your guesses is right. So there's no penalty for just writing down all the things you think it might be within a certain time frame. And then what we do is we tabulate what the most common wrong errors are. And it turns out that mental digits Middle digits are more likely to be an error. The first digit is much more likely to be correct. The um, or the last digit is the last digit is the most likely to be correct. First digit is pretty likely to, and in the middle we get very vague. Um, and there's all sorts of other patterns that you can do. Um, you guys willing to take that? That if I asked you to do math, you'd make errors. The errors would be consistent. We might learn something from it. Blah blah blah. Okay, so. Let's move on to some of the patterns that we observe. So here we have the one-digit multiplication tables in their pristine clarity. Here, one-digit multiplication tables as people know it. Okay, and it varies. Um, I was, you could tell I was doing programmers when I did the, this, I think. 64, actually, we do better at the eight times eight. Um, some people have trouble with that. This area tends to be vague in people's minds. Um, and so we have these in memory, most of them kind of, and some of them like 56, 7 times 8 is 56. If you do timing tests, people are actually working that out. And amazingly, many adults are using inefficient algorithms to work out 7 times 8 equals 56 every time it comes up, even in the same session. Um, I don't know why that is, perversity. Um, another thing that we know is that the length of the answer is going to be the length of the two things. So if it's 20 times, you know, uh, if it's a two digit number times a two digit number, okay, it's going to be a four digit number if both of the things are greater than three, about. And or if one of them is greater than five and the other isn't one or zero. So we've got this kind of, there's an area where it's um, one less than the length of the two arguments together. And so what we're doing in our minds is we're building up a frame. When we see this, we jump to starting to build this thing here. Another thing we do 
is the first digit is much more likely to be small than large. Okay, and we know that instinctively unless we're embezzling. <laughs> One of the things that I've actually worked with auditors that embezzlers do when they're making up data is they're afraid that they're going to give themselves away and the data will look made up. So they use random number generators. And the random number generators uniformly distribute the, um, the, the stuff and they get caught because real data doesn't tend to be that way. It tends to favor the, the smaller digits. Also, the last digits are much more likely, the greens are evens, the reds are odds for a multiplication problem. And we know what the last digit is supposed to be in most cases. Um, the six for seven times eight is, is kind of up in the air um, for some people. And so we start guessing what this digit here is going to be, we start guessing you know, that's going to be two or three, depending on other character, and we start coalescing this thing in. And by disrupting these processes and messing with people, you can start finding out the components of this wonder algorithm that splices things together. Um, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff there. I'm only going to go into one of them. Um, which, yeah, okay. Um, so. Ethanol, okay, ethanol, I have a space filling one that's more like this that I didn't get assembled in time. These are all abstract representations, real ethanol, and this is not to scale, nuclei and a cloud of electrons around it, okay. <laughs> and what's going on here is that the nuclei control the position of the electrons because the nuclei are heavy and they're hard to move and the electrons swarm around them. But the electrons control the position in the nuclei because they have this big extended field and they shepherd and the two things guide each other in a, um, to make something that seems like a, a physical object that has enough stability that we can like brew beer. Um, which is, so that's an important thing for culture and technology. And lots of things work that way. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed that like gas stations and Starbucks and things like that all tend to congregate. There's a couple of things going on there. There's, there's the uh, rule of spatial composite, uh, competition, which um, basically pushes them together, provides a pushing pressure. But once that started, People go to places because they know that they're shopping there, so therefore stores tend to locate there, and therefore people tend to go there and you have this congregation. Ants, when they are foraging, wander all over the place, and they leave a trail of pheromones. And then they come back, and they wander mostly following the trail, and successive ants deviate and tend to cut the corner. So eventually they're making those nice, straight, efficient ant trails. And something like that, very like that happens when we are coalescing on an answer. We think this has got to be even, we think it's got to be a six, that's got to be a two or three, it's got to be about this, okay, yes, so that. Those are inconsistent, so I'm going to push those away. These are consistent, I'm going to hold these together. And it clicks into place and we've got ourselves an answer and you can actually find out those mechanisms. We don't have anything in software that works like that in general use. People have done things called blackboard models and stuff and people have tried to model it in software. Um, but mostly when we're trying to solve problems like playing Go, we send ants everywhere. My thing for the last is a golf ball bomb, right? Where uh, if we were to design a robot to play golf that was based on the same principles the Monte Carlo Go machine, what we would do is we would take, uh, I think I've worked it out like a three meter by three meter cube of golf balls, put a TNT charge in the middle of it, set it off, and then whichever ball lands in the hole, we say, that's my ball. <laughs> that's how Monte Carlo search works. Okay, that's what we do. We don't do this efficiency thing. Um, and I'm rushing here because we're, uh, I'm being told this like, 
Okay, um, how, do you know how am I out of time? I'm on five. Okay, um, so this is a really, this is a fun one. I want to do this one really quick, a little bit of it. Um, there's a game that is really fun to play that um, I give you an integer. You start with one, and you have the operations plus, minus, and times, and a target number. Okay, so if you wanted to, um, if the target number was seven, you could say, I've got my one, one plus one is two, I now own two, two times two is four, um, so now I own four, so I've got one, two, four, um, one plus two is three, four plus three is seven, I've gotten to my goal. And if we had a lot more time, I would give you numbers like 311 and see how long it takes to get to them. Um, let's try that on um, a quick numbers. Um, 17 is the target number. You start with one, you have one, so, um, and actually I'll give you a hint, you have to get two as the next number, because the only thing you, you can multiply it together, you, okay, so what number do you want to get? The goal to have a short answer. The goal is to have the shortest sequence that leads to that. I've got, I've got, I've got a half already. Okay. One, two, four, sixteen, seventeen. Yep, and I think that is minimal. Um, okay, so, and what gets interesting is there's some big numbers that have short paths and some relatively small numbers that have long paths. Finding out whether a path is optimal turns out to be tricky. And I'm just going to rush through the rest of this to get to a conclusion. It turns out that we're using the human wonder algorithm to do that, just as we did for multiplication. The difference being that math facts and rules versus the math facts plus the game, we're doing different things. Misapplication of the rules leads to a wrong answer or an erroneous chain. Um, there's variations. We could try things in different bases. We could have complex targets, different rules. You can, you can play it with, uh, instead of minus, you get XOR um, if you want a, a twist on it. Um, or non-place value systems. And that generalizes to what are called monotonic planning problems. It turns out that these actually are something that we do every day when we like figure out how we're going to get to work and get stuff at the store. The analogy also holds that there are problems come in different sizes. There's small problems and there's some that you could exert a lot of resources on. Some problems have cute answers. Okay, I need a chain that leads me to 65,536. Yeah, minimal chain, right, bam. The analogy breaks down in this case that um, in multiplying, there's a unique right answer and depending on what variation, it's maybe not obvious whether you've got a unique right answer other than by exhaustively, you know, there might be multiple minimal paths and stuff. It's possible to recognize the right multiplication answer. Um, actually, I think figuring out if a thing is um, uh, minimal on the chain, I think that's NP complete. Um, there's a perfect algorithm that's known. The best algorithm that I'm aware of for the chains looks an awful lot like brute force. Um, and um, so the next experiment was going to be, I give you um, arbitrary precision integers and strings and give you some kind of Gennaro language and ask you to write a multiply routine for it. Okay, I'm going to take it that there's enough developers in here and not too many developers in here, twice the size it takes, if we had twice as many people, it'd take twice as long. Um, this is about the size where that's about to kick in, but um, I'm going to say that you guys could probably write a routine to take string representations, the numbers, and multiply them. You guys willing to credit that so we can move on? It turns out that, I'm going to pause here for a second. When you guys solve the Rubik's Cube, if people solve the Rubik's Cube, you can do it with group theory. There's some really cool algorithms. No one does that. What they learn is a bunch of moves that do things, and they learn how to, they can apply them together. They use this wonder algorithm. And when you write code, you do the same thing. We don't program the way we're supposed to program any more than we multiply the way we're supposed to program. We have little bits of, oh, I know how to do this trick. I know how to do this trick. Oh, that's the default initializer thing. I'll do that. You know, that thing. Yeah, I mean, I'll just do that. I mean, that's not right. I'll put it in there anyway. You know, like where we munge it together and our coding is about as accurate as our mental multiplication. But at least we use the same process to write our tests, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, 
there's a really interesting thing here. We could, and actually I'm going to go see if I can finish this up. Um, I had a math class ages ago in college where the, we did the heat equation, and the professor was really good. He had a foreign accent. He was a great professor, but it's hard to understand him sometimes. And we were solving the heat equation. And what he told us is that in order to get traction on this, we're going to assume that the answer takes the form of a series of signs, summation of a series of sine functions. So we start working through it, and we get an answer that's in the form of a series of Bessel functions. And everyone's like, yeah, there we go, that's an answer. And I'm like, but it invalidates the assumption on which we got the answer. And I was like really, you know, upset about this. And he says, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll show you. Let's assume it takes the form of a series of Bessel functions. Work through it, you get it in the form of a series of sine functions. Um, and it turns out that sort of duality happens, and he says really what it is is we were going to get that sine function if we kept going, but we got to a solution early and we short-circuited out and you can, you can start anywhere. So in this talk, we have two things. One, we'd really like to know more about the wonder algorithm. We should understand more how we do these things because for things like the searching that Google does or whatever, getting heuristics that quickly, quickly get to a pretty good answer could be amazingly valuable. And it also could save a lot of power. If we were writing a Go program or trying to do some human problem, human scale problem, capturing how humans do that could save us bajillion watts. Okay, and get a lot of time. It could be very efficient. Two, we need to be aware that when we code, no matter how formal and rigorous and Vulcan we feel like we're being, we're actually just making shit up. And it's <laughs> mostly wrong. And we look at our code like that. That's our code. That's what we think our code is. And it's really, really, really hard for even for professionals and even for the community, the industry at large, to admit just how bad our code is. Um, yeah, so anyway, so this is part seven in an ongoing series, um, and I've got more to say on the subject, but I don't think I have any more time, do I? Okay, so hey, that kind of made like a chunk, didn't it? Cool, okay. Thank you all very much.